Hi, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate it. And, and thank you to Trees for uh, inviting us to present on, on a topic that I'm uh, incredibly passionate about. And I know uh, Mark is as well. And in our discussions over the, the past year or so, um, it, it's just become clear that there's so much to learn about bunion surgery and, and so much further that we can go with this concept. So um, really great to see you, Mark, and, uh, and uh, I really look forward to this discussion that we're going to have about bunion surgery tonight. Likewise. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for organizing. Yeah, absolutely. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of our, our pictures on here, and that way we can kind of concentrate on uh, the thing that we all want to concentrate on. At least that's what I'm interested in is the, uh, the beautiful bunion footage. So um, let's kind of get started here. I'm going to try to get my computer to comply. There it goes. So what we're going to um, go through tonight really is uh, a lot of it is, is background on this whole idea of, of three plane um, hallux valgus evaluation um, or three plane hallux valgus anatomy and then how we apply what we've learned about the, the anatomy and, and how we apply that to using an instrumented system for correction. And, and like many things in surgery, um, instrumentation is extremely important to be able to carry out a procedure um, consistently. Um, we want to we want to have um, excellent results um, day after day, week after week. And it's just a fact with with, you know, total joint replacement with so many things in um, in surgery, instrumentation is important. So we're going to talk about the rationale for the, the procedure itself um, and, and how the instrumentation works and and why we think it's pretty exciting. Um, we're going to talk about um, the anatomy, um, the implications uh, of what it means to look at a bunion differently than I think all of us were trained. So we're all trained to look at bunions in two dimensions. Um, a bunion's a deformity like any other uh, deformity in the body. It's, it's three-dimensional. Um, we have to respect that. And so we need to start looking at the, this problem, this, this uh, bunion deformity in a different way. And, and we're really going to key in on the sesamoids because I think that's what teaches us the most about the three-dimensional idea of bunion surgery is looking at the sesamoids. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you see something new and it's, it's just a rehash of an old older procedure or a different way to do an existing procedure. And so what, what we're going to submit to, to uh, the audience of foot and ankle surgeons tonight is that this isn't just a different way to do the lapidus procedure. This is a completely different way to look at bunion surgery. So, this is not a new and better way to do the lapidus. It's, it's not uh, an improvement on an osteotomy. It's a completely different outlook or philosophy on bunion surgery. And then at the end, we're really um, excited to be able to introduce um, uh, uh, something that we've been working on now for uh, well over a year, which is uh, taking the, the triplane platform of bunion correction and applying that to a truly uh, minimal incision, uh, minimal incision platform. So, yeah, and so I, I think that that Paul is really needs need deserves all the credit in understanding. And I, I have to say, the first time I ever heard Paul's lecture, I it just was eye opening. And I love, and he'll mention it later, but I'll, I'll mention it now that once you see see the concept, you really can't unsee it. So I'll, I'll let Paul take credit for that. And But I really believe that. But there's a reason that bunion surgery has a bad reputation. I've been doing bunion surgery for 20 years now. And I, I really think that I do a good job with bunion surgery, at least the techniques I was taught and uh, then applied and even newer techniques. But I don't think I ever fully understood this triplane correction. So these are fortunately not my cases, but I can tell you that in over 20 years, I have some that uh, have not turned out the way I wanted them to, but it's because I didn't fully understand the concepts. Yeah, and, and I, I, that, that quote, I, I am definitely not gonna take credit for the quote of once you see it, you can't unsee it. That actually comes from um, uh, Merrill Cowie is a foot and ankle surgeon. Uh, he actually worked with us. He started, in, and I can't even remember how long ago. I think it was over 10 years ago um, as a student, as, as really he became our main um, uh, research assistant 
Um, and, and as soon as he, he was in his early um, stages of his education and, and learning about bunion surgery from a textbook standpoint, and, and he, he came to us and said, you know, the way you explain this, you know, once I see this, I, I can't unsee it. So I, I give him credit every time I, I talk about that. And, and it's true, though, when you see the, the difference in the anatomy after a triplane correction, it, it, it's a whole different world. It, it really, it, it opens your mind to, um, you know, something that, that is true in any, any profession, any industry it is, you know, a lot of times we do things the same way because it's tradition and it's what we're taught and, and it's our paradigm. It's the way we see it. Um, but once you see uh, something that is a, um, uh, a different outlook and, and, and it's usually simpler and, and we're gonna show you tonight that this concept is incredibly simple. Um, it really opens your mind. It really changes your, your, um, your whole perspective. And so that's what we hope to do is, is open up discussion and, and hopefully change perspective and, and continue this discussion so we can, we can learn more going forward and really help patients. And so just one, one final thing, I, 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 sometimes I get too wordy, so uh, feel free to, uh, cut me off, Lisa, but, you know, we look at these cases, you know, these, these patients are, uh, many of these are patients that have come into our office and it, it's so easy to look at this and say, oh, you know, well, it didn't work out for the patient. They're not happy because the surgeon did a bad job. And, and that's just simply not the case. That, that is not the case. These procedures were carried out in, in a manner that we were taught. It's just that the, the idea of metatarsal osteotomy, and we're going to talk about this a lot, it is, even though we're taught that, we think that way, we, we apply that, that concept to, to bunion surgery, um, the concept itself, I think, has a lot of flaws. So it's easy to say, oh, I'm, I'm a good bunion surgeon and all my procedures come out well, and, and I see these recurrences, and well, that was just another uh, surgeon that, that didn't do a good job. I, I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think any of these cases are attributable to a surgeon not doing a good job. It's that the procedure itself has flaws in its philosophy. And it, it, you can't really argue the fact that, that if you look into the literature, if you, if you delve into it, um, there's high recurrence rates. If you look at the long-term results of bunion surgery, the recurrence rates are, are, are pretty, uh, pretty unacceptable uh, in my way of thinking. I know when I look back at my um, long-term results earlier in my career, and this was probably 15, 16, 17 years ago. At the time, I would have told you I'm a, I'm a great bunion surgeon. You know, I know how to cut the bone. I know how to slide it. And, and I looked at my results. Uh, my first look back was 80 patients and the recurrence rate and the problem rate was, was, was terrible. I, I was shocked, honestly. Yeah, and so I, I think that that's a good point. And, and you want to delve into why is it a problem? And I really like what Paul said, and that was my point as well, that surgeons do a good job with the operation, but it's just that the operation itself has issues. So it may be acceptable to have some of these results, but it's because our, our norms are not what they should be. And so after an osteotomy, you really are creating a new deformity in the metatarsal. You're not anatomically correcting it. And the original deformity is not really being addressed. It's really that triplane anatomy is not corrected. So it's either a simply translational or a rotational osteotomy and not correcting it at the base to get that triplane correction. And therefore the soft tissue balancing that, that maybe you have to stretch the capsule some to make it work initially but it can't hold up over time because the metatarsal hasn't been corrected in three planes. And so osteotomy alone in most cases won't, won't really follow the, the correction that, that needs to occur. Yeah, and, and you know, we talk almost every other um, problem, every other you know, long bone deformity, you know, we talk about the deformity correction rules and it, it, it really dawned on us uh, quite some time ago that, you know, even though it's acceptable to take a straight metatarsal and, and make an osteotomy and make that metatarsal crooked in, in an attempt to correct the deformity, that's really not acceptable in any other long bone deformity. We, 
you know, we map the deformity, we try to figure out where the apex of the deformity is, and, and we try to do our correction at that point. And, and we know that if we do that, that our results are going to be, uh, you know, the best they can be. And so the thesis of the lapoplasty uh, process or procedure or, or philosophy, I, I've almost gotten away from calling it a, a procedure. It's really, it's really a philosophy. It's, it, it's a way of looking at, at a bunion deformity in a completely different way. And, and the way we look at it is just like any long bone deformity, this is a, a three-dimensional problem. Every, every body um, issue, um, when you talk about a mechanical issue, is three-dimensional. Um, there's also a reason why people get bunions. Um, you know, I, I don't have a bunion and, and I have a very stable tarsal metatarsal joint. And, and that, that's not from the standpoint of, of the hypermobility we're taught, but it's a, it's a, an issue of the structure of the joint, the actual ultra structure of the joint and in the joint surfaces. Um, in bunions, there's a, a single facet. It's a ball and socket joint, um, at least from what we know, looking at the literature and we're, we're looking at this very intensively right now um, as far as what is the shape of the joint and, and why do people have this functional instability of the joint. Um, but the, the bottom line is, and it, and it would be hard to have a debate and argue against this, is a, a metatarsal, a first metatarsal in a bunion is straight. It's just, that's the way it is. The, the metatarsal is deviated. Um, at the TMT, the hallux is deviated at the MTP, but the metatarsal is, is normal anatomically. Um, and so if you, if you look at it from a deformity standpoint, you know, how we look at many long bone deformities, um, it's a pretty simple problem. It really is. It, it, there's really one solution. You just move the metatarsal in three dimensions back where it should be. And then very importantly, if it's true that that joint is functionally unstable, and I, I think it's at least in everything that I've looked at, I think that's a that's a very um, uh, true concept that there's a functional instability. Well, then we have to stabilize it. And uh, uh, Dr. Hansen, Ted Hansen, I think was absolutely spot on, true or, or correct, in that the TMT is a stability joint. It's not a mobility joint. We don't need it, nor do we want it to be mobile. And so locking it in with a bunion correction seems to be the way to go. And again, I, I said it before, but like uh, a, a total knee replacement or, or total hip or robotic surgery, instrumentation improves reliability and consistency. And I, I can tell you as a person who has done three-dimensional corrections well before lapoplasty existed freehand, I will never go back to doing it freehand. It is so valuable to have instrumentation to help me with the correction and then even more importantly, hold the correction in place while I make my cuts and do my fixation. So here's this whole concept of once you see it, you can't unsee it. And it's just so convincing to me. And it's simple. And there've been some other studies done as well, just simple radiographic studies with cadaver um, metatarsals and the rotation, it turns out it, what you're seeing is not really an abnormal bone. It's just a, a normal bone that's incorrectly or, or unstable at the TMT joint. So it's pronated or off in the frontal plane. So you can see that here uh, with these um, axial um, shots right down uh, the first metatarsal, so you can see the crista, and what would be normal has the crista in the right position, the sesamoids reduced. In hallux valgus, the sesamoids are still reduced, but the metatarsal is rotated, so it gives the appearance of being off with regard to the relationship between the first metatarsal head and the sesamoids, but it's actually not the case. The metatarsal is rotated, and you can see that where the first metatarsal head in the, the picture, the second picture down below in hallux valgus is rounded. There's a round sign on the AP view and that reflects what we see on the axial view or the sesamoid view. And then in normal, you can see it's a flattened first metatarsal head, which is anatomic. And the sesamoids are perfectly reduced on the crista, but in the proper rotation in that plane. And that's what the uh, fluoro scan, this dynamic scan is showing that it's simply rotating the head in order to get it positioned properly. And that puts the sesamoids in the proper anatomic position. 
Yeah, and that's, I mean, that is really so important. I mean, this, this um, visual um, aspect um, is so important to understand. We're so used to looking at the AP X-ray and making decisions in two dimensions. And once you understand what the, the changes that you see on the AP, AP X-ray are and how related they are to frontal plane rotation, everything starts making sense. And we'll talk about it a little bit further down, but uh, look at the, the articular angle. So the, the distal metatarsal articular angle on the bottom view, that, that looks deviated. And if we measured the angles the way we're taught, I, I would guarantee that that is gonna measure as an abnormal articular surface. And we're gonna talk about some studies that show pretty crystally clear that that's probably a radiographic artifact, even though we're, we're taught to take that into occurrence. So we're not, not gonna belabor the slide, we're gonna kind of blow by it, but pretty much everything that's been written since 1956 that looks at the three-dimensional position of the metatarsal in a bunion shows the metatarsal to be pronated as a component of the deformity. Now, whether that is pronation at the TMT, um, whether that's torsion of the bone, I, I can't say we know right now, but, but the position is, is the key. And so if, if there's this pronated rot laterally or uh, externally rotated position, we have to take that into consideration in our correction. It's absolutely vital to, to see that and to address it. So here, if you look at what we traditionally use as measures in this AP plane, we're really looking at it in two dimensions and it, it doesn't address that rotational, frontal plane rotational deformity. So if we're looking at the intermetatarsal angle or we're looking at the hallux valgus angle and then the congruity, all things we've been taught, all, of, all reference points we have used over the years to correct a bunion, they really are not that relevant. We really wanna get that straight, normal uh, and normally uh, well, anatomically normal first metatarsal back in the proper position. And that includes the frontal plane, which is a three-dimensional correction, not a two-dimensional correction. Yeah, and it, it, you know, as Mark said it, I mean, it's so true. I mean, you look at that metatarsal and we're taught to see a metatarsal deformity, but there's, there's simply not a metatarsal deformity there. The first metatarsal is deviated inward. Um, it's rotated as well, we, we believe, and in, in, in research would show at a high percentage of cases. And then the hallux is deviated on the metatarsal phalangeal joint. And, and so again, let's, let's go back to long bone deformity correction principles. Where's the indication for osteotomy? I just, I, I mean, I used to see it because that's what I was taught to see. That's, what, that's how I was taught to address it. But I look at this now and, and, I, and I, I just think that there's no indication whatsoever for an osteotomy, whether it's opening, closing wedge, sliding, base, head. I mean, where is the indication, you know, based on deformity correction rules? And we know that hallux valgus, valgus recurrence is, is highly dependent on, you know, getting the sesamoid position correct and then maintaining it. So we can, we can get the sesamoid position correct in every case, it doesn't matter. You just release as much as you need lateral and you placate as much as you need medially. And you, you can wrestle those sesamoids back into the, the you know, perpendicular to the AP plane of the X-ray, but, but how do you keep them there? If the anatomy is not aligned, if the bony anatomy is not aligned, the soft tissues are not going to stay where they should be. The soft tissues follow the, the axial alignment of the, of the bone. And so we have to get the bony alignment right. And when you look at, at recurrence and, and reason for recurrence, sesamoid position is, is at the top of the list for, for reasons why um, bunions recur. If you don't if you don't obtain or maintain the sesamoid position, you're going to open the IM angle. There's just no question about it. And so you can see that here where you've got the um, AP x-ray and you're trying to define the deformity based on the AP x-ray alone, and it just does not. And so if you, if you advance this, you, you really need to understand that the sesamoid position, if it looks abnormal, it, it, it doesn't 
necessarily mean, like we mentioned before, that it's abnormal relative to where it should be. The sesamoids are where they belong on either side of the crista. However, the metatarsal and the whole, therefore the whole complex is rotated. Once that's corrected in the proper frontal plane rotation, then you can succeed with getting this proper correction. Otherwise, you're actually trying, if you don't correct this, you're gonna to try to pull, like Paul said, release soft tissues and put the sesamoids in an abnormal position to try to get it corrected in that two dimensions in the AP view when it really needs a 3D frontal plane correction to make it anatomic and then function properly. Yeah, I, and I think it take you know it, it it it's worth taking just a second and, and looking and thinking about these X rays. So, how how would the soft tissue balancing that I was taught actually help me with these cases? In fact, it it really wouldn't help at all because to get the it, without derotating or or supinating the metatarsal to get the sesamoids to look good on the AP, I have to like Mark said, I have to dislocate them. I have to put the fibular sesamoid on the crista just to make the X-ray look right. Um, and again, it's really really important for the understanding of the concept to 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 see that. <coughs> and we know if you look at all the things we're taught about bunion evaluation. Uh, from DMAA to sesamoid position to hallux valgus angle, it all it really comes down to three dimensions. So we're not we're not here to say rotation is a hundred percent of bunion surgery, but there's no question that we have neglected looking at the frontal plane of the bunion deformity um, for as long as bunion surgery has been around. Now there's been some incredibly um, insightful surgeons like Scranton and Mizuno and Okuda who have talked about this um, and, and uh, Charlie Saltzman, um, but nobody listened for some reason. And, and so we all need to really look back at what's been done over the years and and revisit this idea of, of a bunion deformity being a three-dimensional deformity. And can you go back one, Paul? So one yeah. thing I'd love for you to point out with that, with this video that's, that really defines this, you, you would like to have a sesamoid view, but can you go over some of the anatomic findings, just review those one more time, that you can see in, in the AP plane that gives you some confidence that you've got the rotation correct in the frontal plane as well. Absolutely. So, so what we look at is there's several visual cues um, that Mark's talking about that that not only can show us that there is pronation, but also that we've already that we've uh, corrected the pronation. So, number one is the sesamoid position. So, if we can get a Hardy and Clapman zero sesamoid position, so Hardy and Clapman's positions based on the AP x-ray, if we can get that at zero, we're pretty sure that the yildrum sesamoid station, so that is the, the axial representation of where the sesamoids are medial and lateral to the crista is going to be right. So we look at that. But if you look at this video, look at how much the articular surface alignment changes with going through a, a very pronated position to a very supinated position. So it goes from a extremely abnormal apparent position to almost a, a perpendicular or zero representation. And then the third thing is that's very powerful and that's what um, Dr. Okuda and his group um, from Japan has described multiple times and I think it's very, very powerful is the lateral round sign. So as the metatarsal is pronated in the deformity, you're bringing into profile the, the plantar condyle of the first metatarsal, which is very round. So if you watch this go into pronation, you watch the lateral edge of the metatarsal become extremely concave and the lateral head become very rounded. And so that's what Akuta described as a lateral round sign. And that's it's a very powerful way to know you've corrected it. Now you see it's very straight and very angular along the lateral side and that's normal. If you look at a normal foot, the lateral side of the metatarsal is extremely straight. Um, and so again, very powerful cues that we've now learned we can use on the AP x-ray to offset all of the, the, the you know, um, 
white noise that I was taught about, you know, uh, IM angles and HV angles. These things are, are so important. And then one more thing, go back one more time. I know we need to okay. meet, move through it, but no, this, thing is, for, this is the, the key. But, this is maybe the, to this me, is maybe the best slide of the whole lecture. Well, to me, what I've, I've learned, and, and this makes sense, and I like that again, once I saw this, I, I really couldn't unsee it. It's very convincing, but can you maybe go over a few of your technique tips to, because I've done lapidus procedures for years, but what are the technique tips, and this doesn't even really involve instrumentation except for a pin and maybe a saw blade, but how do you get that first TMT joint mobilized enough? What do you have to release? What do you have to do so you can get this rotation and actually see it, mainly for people that have not done this technique the first time they try it, so they are effective and successful in really getting that rotation. What are some tricks you can teach them? Well, what we do now is we actually use the sagittal saw and we actually, um, we're not removing bone, we're not preparing the joint, but we run it through the joint surface. And that's part of the, it's become part of the lapoplasty technique. And I think it's an incredibly important part and the saw is very it, tactily, it's, it's very easy to feel when you just barely punch through the plantar capsule. And so there's lots of ways to release the ligaments, but the saw is a, is a very, I, I think, an elegant way to release the soft tissue structures around the joint. And to get IM correction, to get frontal plane correction, even to get sagittal plane correction, we have to release the tight soft tissues around the TMT. And so our first maneuver is with the sagittal saw and we, we um, carefully punch through the uh, uh, ligament structures on the plantar surface. And then um, the joystick that you see here, the two millimeter pin in the metatarsal, that was actually uh, 10 years ago, our original way to try to wrestle the metatarsal back into position. Um, and the, the problem with that, though, and, and what the, the power of the instrumentation or any instrument, instrumented system is, is that anything that you're doing freehand, you have to hold it there. You have to have two hands, and I, I say you need four hands to do a freehand uh, correction of a TMT because I have to reduce everything and hold it, and then somebody else has to pin it. And so with the instrumentation, the instrumentation now does the rotation, the IM correction, and the sagittal plane correction all concurrently. And, and, and I, I just, at least from my outlook, there, there is nothing more powerful than being able to correct it and have it just stay there. I can move the foot wherever I want. I can take an x-ray. I, I can do whatever I want and it stays there. So the first thing is you have to release it so that there's free mobility of the TMT. Uh, again, when if you decide to take a course on, on, the, on the technique, on the lapoplasty procedure, you'll learn that, that this saw planing is extremely powerful. And then we usually check it with an osteotome to make sure we're okay. But uh, usually the saw um, cuts are, are very accurate and, and, and loosen things up. Perfect. Yeah, and then, uh, so I think there's, yeah, you can, we can go forward with the next slide. Um, but there's definitely, you know, a need to change this we've all tried various techniques and we need to get it right so we need those consistent reproducible results so why don't you go to the next one and talk a little bit about the philosophy and how simple it really is you've already touched on it well i i mean really it is and and the funny thing is and and i think mark I, i'd love to hear your feedback but i think it's going to be the same as mine is if you show a patient this concept and you show them the osteotomy concept, has there ever been a patient that says, well, I think the osteotomy makes sense? I, I don't think so. And I, I will say one thing that I've been impressed with, with Therese and, and their patient education. So there are a lot of resources for patients and they're out there and patients understand and they want bunion corrections. I had actually three patients in clinic today. I was with patients today and three of them, separately said, you know, I, I was, I came here because I've heard about a technique that may be better, a, 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 a principle of doing this, and it, it's out there, they understand, and uh, they all related some relative or friend that had bunion correction that just didn't quite work out the way they had hoped, and had a recurrence, and it was a long recovery, so I, I've, I've, I've 
much newer to the game here than you are, Paul, but I have to say that this is very convincing and, and patients will come asking for this because it does make sense. So you're right, they, they're not looking to have a bone made abnormally uh, aligned in order to get correction, but to correct it, they understand the concept of correcting it where the deformity lies. Yeah, and it, I mean, it, it really it is, honestly, the whole idea is simple. Now, it, it's, it's hard to understand when we come from years of, of education and training um, that osteotomy is the only answer. And, and there's also this, this mindset that, you know, why would you fuse a normal joint, which, you know, really, if you look at the, the research and there's a lot of it out there, this is not a normal joint. And, and the other side of it is, this is not like an ankle fusion. We're not fusing a, a mobility joint. We're, we're fusing a joint that's supposed to be stable. It's supposed to be a stable stability joint. Um, so when you get beyond our traditional kind of hangups as foot and ankle surgeons, um, this is pretty simple. I mean, there's really not a lot to it. It doesn't matter if it's a big IM or a small IM or a big hallux valgus angle or small. It even doesn't matter if there's a lot of rotation or a little. You just correct each plane of the deformity to the degree that it's deformed. And you just put it back where it's supposed to be. And, and the really exciting thing is that when patients come back for their post-ops where I used to be absolutely terrified to get an X-ray on my osteotomy patients, and I used to try to discharge them at three months. I mean, I, I wanted them out of my life because after three months, you know, the hallux starts deviating. I got to start talking about, you know, why is it deviating? And, oh, that's what we want it to do. And all of the things that we learn to kind of rationalize. Now it, it's fun. And we follow all of our patients, and we have for the last eight years for a year post-op. So we know where they are. And it's fun to get their x-rays. Matter of fact, our patients now see their x-rays before I even see them. They, they're up on a big screen in the exam room before I even come into the room. And they're usually taking pictures of them and putting them on Facebook because they get it. it it's simple, you're, you're just moving it back so it's straight, the foot's narrow, everything's lined up, the big toe joint's moving well, and everything's just working again. And, and that gets to the, you know, this kind of idea of where we've gone wrong in bunion surgery, we look at all of these different angles and, and, and parameters, and you can literally correct everything without touching the big toe joint, other than absolutely that you have to release the tight lateral capsule if it's tight. But otherwise, you can, you can essentially correct everything I was taught I needed to address individually. And as you've done more cases, Mark, have you, have you seen the same thing? I mean, as far as what we were taught, as far as medial eminence resection, that was my first thing I did with a bunion was resect the eminence. And I always had an issue. I, when I did that, I felt like I was looking at normal, normal structures, but I just wasn't smart enough to figure out that it was pronated. It, it always was, I think, oh, I have to be careful when I cut medial to the medial sulcus that I don't somehow get down near where that tibial sesamoid will be and somehow interfere. And I just didn't, it just, it just didn't, I didn't grasp that it was just the whole thing needed to be rotated and it wasn't abnormal at all. It wasn't really a prominent. So I've, I've learned a lot from that. It's uh, it is eye opening, I think. So again, I'm newer to this, but it is, it is uh, absolutely, I love what you said about that. I like seeing my bunion patients back now. Um, I've always liked my patients, but it's just so a tough conversation to have when the thing is recurring, even though you know you did the technique the way you were taught or maybe attended a course on learning another technique because the first one or the first three that you were taught didn't work as well. So this is, it is definitely um, more comforting. It's not, nothing's perfect, but I tell you, this is pretty close to it. Yeah, I I agree. And the, and the most dramatic thing is, and, and we talk about this all the time, is this whole idea of DMAA, that, that it has to be a real anatomic deformity. Um, but we can show now hundreds, actually thousands of cases now, where the DMAA, the articular surface, is essentially completely realigned. And we, ha we haven't touched it. We didn't do an osteotomy at the head. We didn't do a realignment. We didn't do anything. We just we just put things back where they live. We do have like a this from the audience. Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, 
The question is, after reducing the TMT and performing a lateral release uh, at the MPJ, do you ever have to do an Aiken? Yeah, so why don't we save that? It's a great question. And uh, we'll, 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 we'll definitely get to that. We have some case examples, and so we'll show that. OK, and we, we have another question. Um, as you derotate the first met into its proper anatomical position, what role do you feel, if there is one, for a lateral soft tissue release at the first MPJ, adductor, tendon, intermet uh, ligament play? Do you ever find a need for a lateral or soft tissue release? Do you feel the pronation of the first met head contributes to plantar plate rupture, hallux overlapping the second digital deformity? Yeah. I'll. I'll just say in general, with this technique, absolutely there is a lateral soft tissue procedure, but it is, it's, and, and if you get a chance, Treese does a great job of, of, of providing you with education. So resources are there in a lab. You can come do the lab and learn from people like Paul who really know how to do this well, I've worked on this for years. But in general, it's a suspensory ligament release between the lateral capsule and the lateral sesamoid and a slight weakening of the capsule. Now, Paul also mentioned that there are some cases where it's more retract, uh, contracted laterally and you may have to do a bit more than that. So I'll let him speak to that, but there is a soft tissue release, but it's not the adductor. It's not a big release like you may have been taught uh, years ago. Um, it is uh, very specialized to really focusing on that suspensory ligament uh, to release between the capsule and the lateral sesamoid or fibular sesamoid and a bit of the capsule in order to get that, that, uh, that, that slight release, but not a big release of the adductor tendon. Paul, you want to comment? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. So this is a perfect case. So you look at the axial views. So number one on the AP pre-op x-ray, it, it looks like this is a tibial sesamoid position, at least five. Um, but yet the yildrum station, so the, the, the axial position is, is completely normal. But is, so we're not dealing with sesamoid subluxation. What we're dealing with, with the hallux being kind of tight laterally is tight capsule and tight sesamoid suspensory ligament. And so our lateral release, at least my lateral release is, is incredibly simplistic. It's a, partial lateral capsulotomy and a suspensory ligament release. I, I haven't honestly, I mean, full disclosure, even seen or thought about the adductor tendon in a long time, a decade. Um, extensor digitorum brevis it never even crosses my mind. All of these traditional, you know, soft tissue structures that we were taught to sequentially um, address in a, in a soft tissue release, I, I don't, and again, just just my opinion. I, I'm I'm willing to be wrong on this, but this is how I see it. Is it, they don't even have a place in this. It, you know, when the hallux is lateral for a long time, so the older the patient is, the more chance I'm going to need to release that capsule and suspensory ligament. It's just getting rid of the tight tissues laterally. It's just it's ankylosed laterally. And what we used to think was, well, if you release laterally, you have to plicate medially but you don't. Um, if you realign the bone, the medial soft tissues will take care of themselves. If they're thickened due to, you know, adventitious thickening from rubbing, they'll, they'll calm down over time. We used to be, we're not anymore, but we used to be incredibly dogmatic eight or nine years ago about we didn't even touch the first MTP. So if it was tight laterally, we just left it tight. We left it thick medially. And the, the interesting thing is, over time, over the first three to six months of recovery, everything just normalizes because we, we restored the bone alignment and the soft tissues adapted to the bone alignment. And that's, I, I think that's a good way to look at it because with a bunion, what happens? It's, it's not caused by soft tissue, it's caused by bone alignment. And so the soft tissues adapt to the bony alignment. And so if we correct it, same thing happens. The soft tissues will adapt to it. The, the bone alignment is is absolutely key, and I don't want to gloss over this because I I love I absolutely love this quote. This is actually Doctor Easley's quote, and I I I 
can't re- remember where we were. We were doing a lab together and, and he showed cases and he's like, you know, this really works. And, and, and once you see this and do it, I, I think you will, you will feel the same way. So I, I appreciate this quote, Mark. It was just, it really kind of, it, it kind of hit me where I live. Oh, it, it took me months. I, you know, I really thought it out. I wrote, I must've written 50 different pages, little notepads on napkins, trying to get it just right. Um, <laughs> One more question before we move on from here. Uh, yep. Is is there a pronation or a supination deformity of the first metatarsal? Yeah, so uh, I mean, good way to think about it. Think about it, just look at your hand and, and look at your thumb and maybe you believe in evolution or maybe not. But think about how the thumb is an opposing digit. And if your foot is trying to get it in the right position so it stays stable and is not opposing or moving around, it pronates. So the metatarsal pronates um, and it spins in the frontal plane in that direction. It's not a supination. Paul, you want to add something? To yeah. That? And this was, I mean, and this is a, it's a, it's a really good discussion point. And it was actually a big stumbling block for us 10 years ago, because when we started looking, when, when I actually quit doing bunion surgery, cause I, I just couldn't take the stress anymore. It was so much easier to do a, uh, ankle fracture or a charco reconstruction even than a bunion surgery um we started looking at the anatomy trying to figure it out what are, you know what what are we doing wrong and so we we stumbled on some of the ideas of of scranton from 1980 and, and even um well okuda stuff which is more recent and even mizuno stuff back from 56 about this idea of pronation and we're like well they're crazy. They, it, it can't be pronated because the normal range of motion that Hicks taught us is that if the first metatarsal goes up, which it does in bunion deformities many times, it has to invert. And, and so we, we, couldn't, we couldn't get past that point. Um, and so we did a couple of the first cadaver studies with just literally just rotating the metatarsal. We fixed a foot to a plate. We rotated the metatarsal, looked at all the positions. And, and again, it took, it took us a couple of years to actually recognize that what Mizuno said and, and Scranton said and Charlie Salzman said was true is that, that the metatarsal is actually pronating and that's what it makes it look like this. And, and then we started applying that to, to our surgical corrections. And so it was a really big stumbling block because it, it's this, this major point that we're taught that the first ray range of motion is dorsiflexion inversion or supination. But, but you have to look past that. And if you look past that, the first ray range of motion, everybody that's published on it doesn't show that motion to be at the TMT. They show it to be at the naviculocuneiform and the TN joint. And so, so we're not talking about normal range of motion in any way, shape, or form. We're talking about pathology. And people get bunions because of pathology. And, and uh, you know, maybe it's something other than the ultrastructure of the TMT, but, but there's a reason why people get bunions. And, and literally every paper that's been published on the position of the metatarsal either shows a position of pronation or a potential torsion of the metatarsal bone. And to me, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't care if it's torsion in pronation or movement at one of the joints in pronation the solution is supinated. And, and I can, well, we showed you that. I, we're showing you that in this case right here. Um, sesamoid position is dead zero on the axial, looks bad on the AP, and I've made it completely normal just by supinating the metatarsal. And, and so again, so much tradition comes into this, so much of this, this ingrained teaching. Um, uh, but I, I don't know of a, a paper that shows that the, the sesamoid complex relative to the metatarsal is supinated in a bunion. And we, we do need to move along with time so we can get to everything, but there are two important questions that go right with what you're talking about there. So uh, one of the panelists, I mean, sorry, one of the uh, participants is asking, um, do you fuse, like actually prep and fuse the intercuneiform joint um, is there instability between the two? And then the other is, um, can you do this rotation, this derotation back into the 
you know, correcting the pronation without releasing the TM, uh, TMT joint capsule. So maybe go back one slide and you can just look at that screw that you've put between the first and second cuneiforms. We'll get to it later again, but in the interest of time, maybe go ahead and address it since there's a question for it. What do you, what's that dovetail screw that you call it? Um, what, what is its purpose and why would you not want to do a formal fusion and just put a dove, dovetail screw in? So quick answer to both. So why I don't want to do a fusion between one and two and why I absolutely do not want a screw or any kind of fixation between first and second metatarsal is because I want first ray range of motion to remain. And we know 80% or so of range of motion of the first ray is at the naviculocuneiform, intercuneiform, and, navic and uh, talonavicular joint. 20% uh, or so is at the TMT. So fusing the TMT does not take away range of motion of the first ray. I, I have full range of motion, windless effect. Um, it, it does not make the foot stiff. As soon as you put a screw between one and two metatarsals, it's stiff. And so that's why I don't fuse between one and two. The dovetail screw is an anti-rotation screw. Um, there are people that have intercuneiform um, frontal plane instability, and, and that screw is not trying to fuse. It actually, there's nothing prepped. It's actually just trying to stabilize um, uh, any uh, potential uh, uh, recurrence of the rotation of that segment. Um, so I, it's just my personal feeling. I, I, I may be wrong. I'm willing to be wrong, but I, I think locking the first and second metatarsals or, or fusing the first and second rays is why the, the traditional lapidus procedure got a very bad reputation for making a stiff foot. I can tell you, um, with a hundred percent certainty from my own practice, that a, lapid, a lapoplasty foot is not a stiff foot. Our patients are, are um, firemen, they're, they're runners. I have patients running marathons on, on lapoplasty procedures. Their, their first MPJ range of motion, their, their first ray range of motion is robust. Um, so anyways, long, long answer, but that, that's, that's why I don't prepare or put screws between one and two. Perfect. And then one other thing was just, can you get the ro the derotation or correct the frontal plane rotation without releasing the TMT joint capsule? No. Right. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah, we better move along. We're going to, we got yep. a great group listening. We want to make sure we get to all the points. Yep. So, so this is where it really gets interesting. So we have, we have a, a practice that's 80% bunion surgery now. It's, I, I live this every day. So we have a lot of patients with revisions. We have a lot of patients that have had osteotomies on one side and, and triplane uh, correction on the other side. And I think, this, I think this really sums up a lot of what we're trying to talk about. So this is a traditional long arm Austin and Aiken, um, absolutely done correctly. I didn't do this, but I don't, I don't fault how this was done. But the reason that I have this picture is because um, a year before I did her triplane correction, and this was well over 10 years ago, this is not even lapoplasty um, fixation, um, she had had an osteotomy. And the reason I have it is because she came back at eight years post-op and she had a stiff, painful, arthritic um, first MTP and she, she hated it and she loved her other side. And so she wanted me to do a triplane correction on her right side. Unfortunately, I couldn't, but I did a, a first MPJ fusion and, and she was really happy with that and functioned well. But I think this tells the story when you look at the difference in, in, in anatomic alignment and structure following the two different philosophies. And, and that's really what we're talking about is we're not saying that everybody's doing their osteotomies wrong we're saying that maybe there's a better way that we can look at this in a conversation that we can have to, to push this forward and, and to make it better for patients. And, and so you can, you know, again, a lot of people, I think, think that the lapoplasty is just a better way, or we're, we're trying to say it's a better way to do a lapidus procedure. Well, it's not, it's totally different than the lapidus procedure. Um, it, 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 stands on the shoulders of, of the great Dr. Lapidus, and, and I totally credit him for 
for looking at the TMT as the apex of the deformity, um, but it goes far beyond that whole thought process of hypermobility and and just moving the, the metatarsal in one plane. And this is a perfectly acceptable, well done lapidus traditional on the left, but compare it to the right. And, and I wish I could have the patient here to talk to you about how she feels about the left foot versus the right. Matter of fact, we're, we're gonna actually do a, a fusion of her first MPJ um, here upcoming. Um, but it, from the soft tissue standpoint, the, the minimally invasive standpoint to the robust correction standpoint, it's a, it's a completely different thought process. And, you know, basically let's, let's correct it in three planes. So I'll let Mark yeah, walk that's... us through some of the technique. Yeah, and just, again, you need to come to one of the labs. Trees does a great job. I attended a lab, it was fantastic, and learned much more about this. But it's a basic, the basic principles are, it's a triplane correction, and you have instrumentation to help you with that. Like Paul said, you need almost four hands with a properly done lapidus procedure if you're gonna correct in that in three dimensions. So you have instrumentation to make that easy. You can see that being demonstrated here with a positioner. And then once you've established that, once you know you have the right position, then you can pin it and only then will you make the cuts. So you align your cut guide after you've done the correction. And then you can prepare the joint like any other joint. People say a lapidus procedure doesn't heal well or the TMT joint doesn't heal well or fuse well, well, that's not true. If you have proper instrumentation to get the bones opposed in the right position with maximum surface area, and you prepare the joints properly, you can get that to heal just like any other joint. And then it's stable anatomic fixation. And that's probably for another day, another discussion, but the dual plating concept um, allows it to be stable but still allows for just a little bit of micromotion as you mobilize this patient early, there are just enough stresses across there to stimulate healing, um, but still maintain the correction and maintain stable fixation. Yeah, and that's, I, I would love to have, I could have a whole day conversation on, on bone healing and the whole concepts um, that uh, really arguably Ilazarov taught us about, you know, stability is, is more important than rigidity. Um, but, uh, you know, what we're looking to do here is get everything in a line, everything in perfect alignment before we have to commit. So my, you know, my way of doing a lapidus before I had instrumentation was essentially eyeballing it. I looked at it. I said, okay, I'm going to, you know, make my cut here. I'm going to angle it there. I, I, you know, you jump in, you make the cut and it's either a good day or it's a really bad day. And, and that's just, you, you don't want to walk into the operating room with that stress. When I walk into the operating room and I have, and again, 80% of what I do surgically now is, is bunion. So I, I'm doing seven, plus a week and I walk in, I know what I'm gonna do. I know how it's gonna be done. There is no mystery and that's through the instrumentation and, and we're correcting it, we're looking at it, we know it's what we want and then the cut is the same every time. So, you know, if, if you use this mentality that you have to calculate your cut or template your cut, you almost never are gonna be right, you know, yeah, a high percentage of the time. When you use the concept of you correct it, then you apply the same cut guide every time. That, that is the absolute um, definition of consistency. We wanna reduce variability. We wanna do it the same every time. And, and so we like that, we, we love the fact that there's no leap of faith. We, we know exactly where it's gonna be. And, and so this is, this is what we do. We loosen up the TMT, we put in a fulcrum, which is incredibly important. We put the positioner on and this thing does the three plane correction. And it's, once it's corrected, I can take my hands off. Nobody has to touch it. I can move the foot and it's exactly where it needs to be. And yeah, so the, the, it's, uh, I tell you, you said, you showed the video earlier and that's hard to unsee. The other thing that's really for me was eye-opening was how consistent that cut guide is. So it is important that it's put in the proper position and that can easily be taught. 
And then how little bone is removed because I just could not wrap my head around. So it's a cut guide and sometimes I might get lucky, but many times I'm probably gonna take too much bone and be disappointed. But I just, in the dozens and dozens and dozens of cases I've done now with this, it has just not happened. It is consistently a minimum resection. So I'll show you a quick case, one actually I did this week. So I was fascinated because I, I, when I've done lapidus procedures before, or, or at least surgeries that are somewhat similar, um, I would immobilize my patients for uh, weeks and weeks and, and be very protective and make sure they didn't get on their foot too early um, because I didn't want to have it fail. I didn't want to have it recur. So this is a patient I operated this week. And she came back to me four weeks after her left side was done and said, okay, I'm ready. I got to have my right side done. It looks good. I'm just ready. And I just for me, Paul, Paul probably does this all the time. But for me, I thought, wow, that's a, maybe a little bit early. But she was completely stable, confident, minimal swelling, and could support herself. So I went ahead and, and, and tackled her right side. There was a question asked earlier about, do you do an Aiken? Well, I still believe that there's probably hallux valgus interphalangeus, and I believe that if I can do a tendon transfer with the Aiken, meaning I move the extensor hallucis longus tendon and possibly the flexor hallucis longus tendon slightly more medially, maybe I'll have a more straight pull traction. But Paul's starting to convince me too that that may absolutely be not un completely unnecessary. This is a patient that's younger. She has some congenital uh, issues with her foot, in my opinion. And so I add the Aiken just because she has a relatively shallow Chris, Krista. And in my hands, I want to make sure I get the best correction I can. So I add the Aiken. And you can also see that I added that dovetail screw, like Paul described before, to give more stability. So I just flip to the next slide. And you can see here, just like Paul described, so I, I've got the correction with a fulcrum in place to give me a little extra support and correction. Um, at the base, I've got the pin that I help rotate, and then I've put the positioner in place. So now I've got the correction, and now I'm putting the cut guide on, and I still look at the cut guide sometime. There's a little positioner, a joint seeker that allows me to put the guide in the right position, but I still look sometimes and think, oh gosh, I'm going to take too much bone. So I get nervous about it, but I've really gotten over that fear. This sits perfectly just about every time I have to make a mistake. If I follow the principles here, it can, I really cannot make a mistake. You see, I've already got the correction cut guides on. I've made the cut. And then I'm, I've got a, a compression device on that I first use to distract to get into the joint to prepare it and get the bone out. And then I compress while I'm controlling the metatarsal and then a threaded pin to help hold it and stabilize it for me. If you can go to the next slide, you can see here, there is a shallow crista. It may not be the best sesamoid view, but this is intraoperatively. Um, I'm looking at it. And so in this case, you can see me adding this dovetail screw that I'm putting just in between, but really just behind, just proximal to my two, my dual plating. And then I added the Aiken as well. And uh, go to the next uh, slide. So in this case, um, just watch this for a second. Okay, good, that's great. Come on out, good. So even with the capsule wide open, this toe is completely well aligned. And, and Paul will probably wring my neck for having opened this. One thing you have to remember, you never open up distally first, because if you open up the soft tissues, obviously, if you're going to rotate proximally, you cannot get uh, the sesamoids to follow. You'll disrupt the soft tissue envelope if you, distally. So I've done the correction. It's all good. Um, but she had this dorsal prominence. So it's not... Um, a medial eminence, she just had a dorsal prominence, which some patients have, so I decided to take that down, which allowed me to peek into the joint. And what I'm fascinated, a reason I want to show this case is, I have the medial capsule open so I could get to that, and just like a total knee replacement, if I have the rotation right, if I put it in the proper position, the patella will track perfectly even before I close the extensor mechanism. Same with this, if I have the rotation right, the relationships are all correct. I don't even need a medial capsule. So Paul never, but, almost invariably, almost never opens this. And um, I just happened to have this opportunity where it just was fascinating to me to see how perfectly attract, even with the capsule open because I've got the bony alignment correct. 
Yeah, no, Mark, I, I actually totally 100% agree. And I'm so glad you put this case in because Mindy and I actually open the medial capsule uh, a fair amount of the time. And it's to get that capsular ridge that you show there. So that's not a medial eminence. That's just the capsular ridge that makes a bump. And we'll also thin the capsule. But the teaching point here, and, and Mark pointed it out so well, and, and we cannot overemphasize this. That toe is perfectly straight and there's no medial plication. I, I have to tell you, I, I did a lot of osteotomies. This is my 30th year of practice. A lot of osteotomies. There was no big toe that was straight after an osteotomy. It always had to be a medial capsular plication. And in the difference in this philosophy is once you align the, the bony alignment and in Mark's um, uh, analogy to a total knee is absolutely right. That's the point. If you don't get the total knee aligned, it, the soft tissues are not going to hold that in position. And we can talk about total ankles. So what is the absolute um, worst thing for a total ankle replacement? Well, it's a deformity. It, 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 the soft tissues can never hold a joint in alignment. And so, and that, that is so important. So the soft tissues around the joint are not for correction. They're not for reinforcement. They're not for any of that. Like we were taught, the, the bone alignment is the key. Absolutely key point. And then here with regard, we talked about this earlier, but this whole idea that doesn't heal well, this is like anything else in orthopedics. You still have to prepare the surface as well and then get stable fixation, which you can do with this. So as long as you have the bone preparation um, and you stay, get a stable fixation, this is going to heal and it's going to heal reliably. Um, ideally, you don't strip too much of the periosteum. Um, and so you, you maintain basic principles for handling surfaces that you're trying to get to heal. Hey, back to the dovetail screw, we have a question um, and they are asking, are you preparing the intracaneiform, intracaneiform joint when placing that screw? Yeah, so I'll let Paul answer that, but I had a tough time wrapping my head around that too. And I feel like, should I fuse the intercuneiform joint? Should I fuse between the first and second columns or first and second rays like Lapidus originally described, Paul Lapidus described, but we really don't want to do that. And I like what Paul, Paul said it very elegantly early, uh, uh, earlier or eloquently earlier that that you want to maintain that motion in that medial column. So the dovetail screw is not designed to fuse. It's designed to help. And it's actually, if you saw my, my uh, photo I put in there, it comes from slightly plantar to slightly dorsal to help lock that first ray into the second, but not fusing. So the joint is not prepared. It can still have motion, but it keeps that rotation. It rotates, further rotates that first ray into the second. Paul, yeah. you want to... Yeah, I think I think uh, the way that I look at it is it's not to um, hold or reinforce transverse plane correction. So we look at that and we say, well, that's just to hold the IM angle. And that that is absolutely not the function of it. It's actually to hold the metatarsal from going back into pronation. So it's it's an anti-rotation screw. Um so I can tell you, and I'm telling you from personal uh, bad experiences, um, you cannot use that screw or a screw between one and two to get, a, you know, the, I'm, I'm finger quotes right now, get a little extra correction, you know, use the screw to kind of kind of tuck down the IM. It, it will fail 100% of the time. The correction has to be perfect. And that screw is just to limit some of the frontal plane rotation which in effect limits all of the soft tissue forces that, that act around the MTP to drive the metatarsal out of alignment. Um, in our practice, we use it sometimes, I would say more rarely. Um, our priority is 100% correction. And if you get 100% correction, that screw's job is to just protect it. It's not to reinforce it. It's not to fuse anything. Um, so that, that's been, my experience has been when I've used that to try to get that little bit of extra correction, it's, it's not good for anybody. Um, so. Yeah. And go, go to your next slide. Cause I think that's important too. 
um, with regard to healing. So we talked about, does this heal? I, I love this. I think that was really, really important what you did here to study that because there will be times if you compress it fully, um, does this, if you don't have a complete contact at six weeks, is that a problem? So describe what you found in this study because I, it does give me confidence. Yes, there's a chance that at some point some of these may not heal, but it's pretty rare. And if it initially you don't see the healing, doesn't mean you have to intervene because what have you found, Paul, over the over the years? Well, it, it, you know, we're we're dealing. We're not dealing with primary healing. We're dealing with callus healing. Which, if if you look at really all of the bone healing literature, callus healing is is faster to a stable construct because it's more natural. And I had the honor to, to come out to North Carolina and, and work with um, Mark at a, a lab. And, and he introduced me to uh, one of their, uh, one of the Duke uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeons, who's a, a, a world famous Ilazarov surgeon. And, and so we got to talk and, and Mark started a conversation about, you know, does this idea of biplanar plating with no compression, does this make sense? Is it even... I mean, why should this work? And he's like, yes, this is, this is the concept of bone healing. And when you really look at the bone healing literature, it's compelling this idea that highly compressed surfaces and rigid constructs are the best. Um, it's really not true. And so this is based in, in when I started doing this 12 years ago, it was based on when I came back from Russia and did a mini fellowship at the Ilazarov Institute and, and started actually truly what I, what I felt was understanding bone healing. Um, and so the, the idea is if there's a little bit of soft callus that's visible at six weeks, um, this study uh, of 195 cases pretty much showed what we see uh, in, in almost all of our cases now is you see that little bit of a, a soft callus and, and just over time through normal bone healing, it goes away. And anybody that's done um, limb lengthening understands this fully because they know the regenerate looks pretty wimpy to begin with. And as you walk on it and you have the cyclic, cyclic micro motion, um, you have a maturation of the, of the regenerate and, and it heals. And, and so, yeah, we get, we get um, uh, x-rays from surgeons all the, almost daily. It's like, oh, oh my gosh, there's this little halo in the middle. And it's like, nope, that's, that is what we're looking for. And so you guys can read the study. We don't need to belabor it, but, um, but there's compelling uh, uh, bone healing evidence. And most of it's from the AO group um, who taught us um, primary bone healing back in the 50s and 60s. And the last 20 years, they've been concentrating much more on this whole idea of natural bone healing and relative stability. We do have yeah, so a few more the, questions that yeah, have come in. Um, yeah, and we'll, and uh, Deepak, let me get to those. I see them. Um, this, I wanted to save him for this case. So this is another case that I did this week. And I worried about this case, okay? So uh, one of the question is, do we worry about the dovetail screw breaking over time? Or maybe Paul can comment at some point too, does it ever back out because it's not a fusion of the joint? Uh, the other is, um, do we have any problems with uh, first metatarsal shortening? And so do we need to shorten the second metatarsal? And then the third thing is, um, uh, is there ever a need for like an interpositional graft to, to create lengthening? So let me just take you through this case. Um, you can see here, it's a young girl that had had, I'd really like to get to her right foot, but her left foot was still a problem. Well done surgery uh, by, well, uh, by an accomplished uh, pediatric orthopedic, um, you know, orthopedic uh, uh, surgeon, um, but basically doing a distal and proximal osteotomy. And unfortunately the bunion recurred and uh, you can see I had a weight bearing CT to help define the deformity more, but it's, it's difficult to see, but it's definitely still not corrected in the frontal plane. So go to the next slide. And so I, even though the metatarsal head had, had, had been previously operated and there was bone removed, you can see same principles apply, even though it's a revision surgery. And even though it's a, um, it's uh, maybe has some congenital component, again, maybe a shallow crista. So I'm using the fulcrum to my advantage. I'm rotating, I've freed up the joint and I'm getting that head or what's left of it centered properly over the sesamoids, but I'm not even doing that really. I'm just rotating 
it distally, approximately rotating so I can get the distal correction and just get the rotation of that whole complex in the right position, even in a revision, revision situation. Next, go to the next slide. And then I've got my, my fixation. Again, I'm going to hold this. You can see where I've corrected at the base. I'm using, again, the fulcrum to my advantage. Now I have the positioner. And now I have the position that I want. And only then will I do my cut. Now, this has had prior surgery and doesn't look as dramatic on this fleura of you. But the original x-ray, I was concerned about shortening. And I thought, should I put an interpositional graft? But What's important here is, again, I've got the cut guide where it needs to be, and I'm not going to make a cut until it's properly corrected. And then I'm going to make the cut and go to the next slide. And you can see here that with it in the proper position, that is absolutely a minimum cut. It's a the cartilage and a few, just few bone chips of that subchondral surface. And then I'm going to compress. And, and one trick to the compression here is I don't just put the compressor on and hope for the best. I'm going to put it on and also use the windlass mechanism and make sure I get, have good contact. You can see here that I ensure that there's no plantar gapping. So that goes to the question of, do I need to lengthen it? Um, do I need to shorten the second toe? And let me have Paul comment because he has some good theories on it. But you can see there that it's actually minimal shortening, and I'm making sure that I don't elevate the first race. So, Paul, what are your what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, it, absolutely spot on. So, um, uh, first point is that the cut guide is calibrated to take the cut off of basically letter A. So that looks like it's not going to prepare the whole joint, but it. it it absolutely will prepare the entire joint. So what we're used to is lining it up like B, and that's the traditional lapidus cut that shortens like crazy. Um, now there's some question whether longitudinal shortening is actually an issue. Um, it may be actually failure to correct deformity or elevation that, that causes a subsecond overload. I can just give my experience that I rarely, if ever, have to do second or third metatarsal osteotomies anymore with this, this technique and this philosophy because we're restoring function of the first ray. And so we've, we've actually studied this and we're, we're intensively studying it now. Um, so the shortening from the procedure, and this is from a uh, registered national clinical trial, um, so this is this is a, a, a legit um, prospective four-year study that we're enrolling patients for, um, and uh, the shortening is about three millimeters. And so if you look at the anatomy, the just the cartilage and a portion of the subchondral bone on each side is about a millimeter and a half. So that's to me about the right amount of bone. Um, but that shortening is measured relative of the first metatarsal to the second. And we all know if you plantar flex the first metatarsal, it looks shorter because we're doing a relative measurement. Uh, we did a, an absolute measurement on this patient cohort too, and this is gonna go on. So we're gonna have four year data from this, this patient cohort. Um, but it was two and a half millimeters. And, and so we have to be careful when we talk about this relative measurement of first to second. It's really about alignment because when we look at this, this cohort, which was just a small cohort, I think there's about 150 patients registered now in this trial. Um, uh, there was zero out of 35 at six months that had subsecond pain. And I can tell you there was five patients that entered the study with subsecond pain and they didn't have metatarsal second or third metatarsal osteotomies to correct that. So it, our experience is showing us and we're seeing it more and more that the lesser rays are protected through the, what Mark has talked about and what we've both talked about um, a lot tonight is this functional realignment. We need to functionally realign um, the, the segments to get the first rate of function normally and bear weight. And it's just another example here. This is one of my cases too, where it's just extraordinary to me um, how little bone is actually removed if you put the cut guide in the proper position. Um, and you can see here, you just wanna make sure you get it in all three planes uh, before you make that cut. And once you've made the cut, that you still have it properly opposed in all, uh, in, in all three planes. Now there can be some bone left residually plantarly that has to be cleared just like when you did a lapidus procedure before, 
And this with the lapoplasty that applies as well, there may be a little bit of bone that has to still be removed. So the question was, Paul, if you yep. put that dovetail screw in, um, does it ever break? Does it ever loosen? Does it back out? Have you had any experience uh, where it's been a problem? So with the dovetail screw, um, I have not had an issue with it backing out or breaking. Um, I, I would defer to Bob Santrock, who has probably done um, vastly, I mean, 200% uh, more dovetail screws than I have, and he has not seen a problem with it. Now, when early, early, early on, when we were putting a screw between the first and second metatarsal, we had a 50% breakage. So again, I think that teaches us a lot. What's happening is we're not actually shutting down or limiting the first ray range of motion like a screw between the first and second metatarsal does. We're just limiting that frontal plane instability um, to try to um, help reduce the um, uh, reduce the chances of uh, unstable recurrence. Yeah, and you'd have, you can put your thumb between the first and second metatarsal heads uh, once you've done the lapoplasty procedure. And if there's still, it looks like it wants to splay some, that would be one indication of maybe where it would be useful. Now, Paul will be upset. I made a bone that was anatomic and made it non-anatomic with my Aiken. <laughs> but that's just, this is my, you know, my belt and suspenders worry in this congenital case where there's really no crista. You saw that on the CT, she has no crista. So I'm just trying to give it every possible chance to make that work. Um, yeah. No, I, so, I like that. I like that. I, the the uh, other case that you showed too, I totally agree with the Aiken and that one. That that clearly had an inter interphalangeal deformity. Um, and there, I don't do a lot of Aikens, but I, if the Aiken needs to happen because of an interphalangeal deformity, that it, it needs to happen. The Again, just soapbox again, we can't use an Aiken to make up for not doing the proximal first ray correction. I think that's where the Aiken has gone wrong. And there's plenty of studies to show that an Aiken and an osteotomy, it doesn't make any difference whether, you know, if you do an osteotomy, the Aiken doesn't add anything to the procedure. This is a totally different philosophy. If you do the proximal work and it's dead solid, um, you know, straight in all three planes, and they still have interphalangeal uh, deformity, you, you have to do that. But, you know, again, now we're following deformity correction principles rather than my, um, you know, 30-year-old bunion correction principles that I was taught, which are different. Yeah. Real quick, too, I know we're going later. Um, there's just a question about, do you ever have to use an interpositional graft? And if you do that, you have these dedicated plates, but is there enough room to stabilize that as well? Yeah, I, real quick, biplanar plating, hands down, is the best platform for interpositional graph the same way a, a circular frame or a, a multi-planar frame is the best for interpositional graph for say a, a tibial non-union um, hands down matter of fact the first case that we used um, biplanar plating for and I, we're probably not the first ones in the foot but we're the first ones to publish it um, it was 10 12 13 years ago, and it was for an interpositional graft, and, and it worked so well from a stability standpoint, we started applying it to primary fusions. Um, so yeah, hands down, if you have to do an interpositional graft, I, I again, I'm obviously biased, but um, when you look at the mechanics, when you look at, um, you know, the stability from a multi uh, multi-planar standpoint, there's there's nothing that matches uh, biplanar plating. So there, the exciting thing is we actually have quite a bit of literature to support this concept of triplane correction. Uh, it's been looked at for for well over a decade, and there's more and more clinical studies showing low non-union rates. Um, we talked about that already. Very low recurrence rates when you compare it to the traditional rates. So, you know, there's a lot of ideas out there that are just trying to you know, re-engineer a, a procedure that's been around for a long time, not really change a philosophy. And this this whole concept, and I, I would encourage you guys to read the literature, Therese can provide it to you, but 
it's exciting because we're really seeing a change in the overall outcomes, not just a change in the, you know, uh, the mechanics of a procedure, but the change in the philosophy of why we're doing something and how we're doing it. Yeah, there's another, that was, I think this was my first case I ever did. And I just was so skeptical. <laughs> Still had to open it up immediately. <laughs> totally unnecessary. It worked perfectly well. So just a one time, this was a couple of years ago, but just learning how this can actually, like I said before, um, it really does work. Yeah, that's awesome. And so just really quickly, so this, there's nothing different about the um, mini incision system. It's just an attempt to try to limit soft tissue um, dissection. I mean, that's, that's the point. So it's, that's a tenet of lapoplasty. We, we try to be minimally invasive in everything we do. Um, so we've been working um, really hard over the last year to try to uh, come up with a, a, a way to do a s even smaller incision. So I would consider the standard lapoplasty incision pretty darn small when you compare it to the traditional you know, lapidus procedure. But this is super exciting because now we're able to do the same thing. And, and that's the whole idea. This is not a compromise. There's no compromise. There's no, um, you know, blind surgery or, or um, throwing away the principles of triplane correction. The, the mini incision system uh, upholds all of the, the stringent principles of lapoplasty, which is full three-plane correction, biplanar plating, robust um, fixation for early weight bearing, and, and doing that through a smaller incision. So it's really exciting. I don't know, I don't even know if we're at the, the, the pinnacle of this yet. I don't, I don't know if there's uh, a, not a way that we can uh, get better and, and actually smaller with the incision. But um, again, the exciting thing is, and, and what I'm really proud to be, you know, part of is that we're keeping all the same principles. We're not saying, oh, don't worry about triplane correction. It's 100% lapoplasty. It's just done through a smaller incision. Yeah, this is, uh, and then we, we, we probably should move along, but this is great. Um, it, I've, I, again, I'm in everything that I do in my practice, I'm still um, old school as far as just exposure, the philosophy, wounds heal side to side. I do like this though, and I, I will say that even though I do the traditional lapoplasty, a more a longer incision, I still use these mini incision cut guides. And I think that's probably the best way to introduce. If you haven't done a lapoplasty procedure, you should probably start with a standard lapoplasty procedure, get familiar with it, then work into using the smaller cut guides and that instrumentation, the plate holders, and maybe even this this plate that is a little more contoured for the smaller incision, and then work your way into the true mini incision technique. We did have one question, Paul, real quick. The incision between the first and second, the dorsal first web space, somebody's having, uh, one of the participants having some trouble with that healing. Have you had any issues with healing um, at the first web space incision for that lateral suspensory ligament release? No, no, not, not at all. Um... We don't do, I don't do a blind stab. I actually do, uh, it, it's not a big incision. It's probably, oh, I don't know, seven or eight millimeters, but I, I directly visualize the capsule when I do my lateral release. Um, kind of like you, Mark, I'm, I'm a little yeah. more traditional as far, I want to see it and, and yeah, you know, I'm, I'm careful getting in and, but no, we haven't ha had any, uh, any issues or difficulties with that incision. Um, yeah, so, you know, we so follow, we might... go ahead. Yeah. You know, I was just thinking, so one thing, I, it's a good time to mention it, that the lapoplasty group is, is very accessible. So if you're interested in the technique, you haven't used it, or you have been using it for some time, and you have some of these issues, be it soft tissue, be it fixation, be it rotation, anything, please reach out. We will be happy to answer any questions. And uh, every day, what do you think, Paul? There must be five or six cases that the the group reviews um oh. and then at, at least right and so yeah I, I yeah think just send them our way and we'll try to help you through some if you have any issues yeah that's that's the beauty i mean it's a community this is not just about a 
a plate or a screw. This is this is actually a, a community, and and we're we're all so committed to you know your patient successes and and our own patient successes, and and it it's really um, it's really exciting. I it, it's it's so fun. We like Mark said, we get you know four or five six questions a day, and invariably the entire advisor team chimes in within a few minutes it's it's almost a contest to see who can uh, can answer first and and it, it's really it, it's like nothing else i've been involved with and and again it's all about the patient outcome and and making sure that that we as uh, surgeons are successful doing what we we promise our patients that we're going to do So we've gone a little long, but this isn't just about pretty x-rays, it's about function, it's about alignment. And if we get the three plane alignment right, the foot works and the patient can go run a 10K or go for a walk uh, with their dog or um, do whatever it is they want. And that, that has been our experience is that um, pretty much anything uh, from a function standpoint is possible as long as we get good alignment. And so, you know, back to the my patient from from ten years ago, um, it's pretty clear. I mean, you know, seven years post op on the left, that looks that looks pretty normal. The patient is functioning extremely well, and we compare that to the way I was trained to do bunion surgery. Um, you know, it it definitely is food for thought. I we we don't know we don't know everything about this. Um, we hope we're on the right track. We want everybody to think about this, talk about it, um, argue about it. Uh, it's a fun conversation, get involved and, uh, and someday we'll figure out absolutely the, the perfect way to do bunion surgery. Well, great work, Paul. We have one last question I think we could do. Um, and that is, um, do you have any tricks to getting the plantar lateral cuneiform bone out? So you've made your cuts, you've removed the cut guide, you've distracted, but there's still some lateral cuneiform bone on the plantar side. How do you safely get, remove that? I, you know, I think that's a, a, a twofold or a threefold question for me. So planing, I, I make sure I do my planing correctly. Um, make sure it's released. I think that's extremely helpful to release part of the ligaments. Um, make sure that the cuts are done all the way, you know, down to the bottom of the bone. And then I don't, I don't grab with a ronger anymore and just try to pull the fragments out. I actually take a six millimeter osteotome and I put it all the way to the bottom of the joint and I just pry as I'm just lifting with a pickup. And I got to tell you, I would say eight times out of 10, we get both fragments out intact um, in very short time frame. We don't do a lot of digging anymore. Now there are occasions where I have to go dig in for one, but I use more of a crowbar technique where the osteotomes are all the way at the bottom, just under the fragment. And I, and I, I kind of pry up with it as I'm pulling. And it's surprising how uh, how quick and easy they come out. I used to dig in there with a ronger and get pretty get pretty aggressive with it, but um, we we use that technique now, and they come out pretty darn easy. And I think to answer the question too is, like Paul said, it, it may be that you're not obviously you don't want to be too aggressive and start leaning over where you may catch the next ray over toward the the second metatarsal, you don't want to cut into that, but you may not be dropping the saw blade all the way to get that bone. And then if it does break free, maybe use Paul's technique of freeing it up so you don't crack the bone when it could be removed as one piece. You can also drop a, if there's soft tissue attached to it, you can get the knife in there carefully if you need to and separate it so that it comes out as one piece. If for some reason you still have a ridge of bone down there, you can take the saw into direct visualization with the joint completely distracted with the distractor and just very carefully touch it. You don't wanna create a new plane, but just you can run around, use the, the previously cut surface on the cuneiform as a template and just touch it very lightly and you'll finish off the bone down there and you can extract it. But those would be some of the techniques. But with the way Paul said, you shouldn't have to do that if you drop the saw in properly. Yeah, straight, just straight up and down all the way 
you know, carefully feeling for the bottom exit. Epoch, do you have any more questions uh, that we may have missed? No, I think we have captured them all. Great. Uh, I'm, and I hats off to Paul. Paul, you know, I'm. I just came onto this because I I was really convinced by it, and I, it's just extraordinary what I've learned from it and continue to learn. It's just fascinating. Um, but it really is about patient care, and patients recognize too that they're. That, that, that this is probably at the current time the best way to approach this deformity and problem. And, uh, but I, I think that what, what I can't emphasize more is that if you're a surgeon and you're doing these operations, there is so much support for you. So please look at what Trees has to offer you and take advantage of it. There's a great group that wants to learn more, is always learning more and wants to share that knowledge with you at any point be it for one patient or in general principles, come to the lab or just reach out and there's these resources. And if you have patients, make sure your patients and their friends considering bunion surgery take advantage of the great resources that are online too. It's, uh, it's really the complete package. And um, I've always been uh, uh, very careful in, in where I wanna, uh, how I wanna do my surgeries and, 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 and take a long time to, to wrap my head around the concept, but this one's pretty easy to do. Um, it really makes sense. So uh, from a patient perspective, from a surgeon's perspective, um, it really um, is a game changer. Yeah, well, thank you for the kind words, Mark. I, I tell you what, this, this whole, uh, you know, the whole journey um, with bunion surgery and, and, and this great relationship that we now have with uh, Treese and a, a group of honestly people I, I've never, never had the honor to be involved with like Treese where they care so much about the outcome. That's what it's all about is the outcome and all of the surgeons involved, um, you know, like Mark said, you know, we we actually enjoy getting, you know, questions from other surgeons. It's it's not uh, competitive at all. All we want to do is help make sure the outcome is good, and it's a really uh, it's a really great part of our uh, part of our day. So, and the the other thing that really impressed me, and obviously we need to wrap this up, but nobody in this group rests. So. It's not as though it's all been defined and there's no more thought about it and you're just pressing on with these same, um, the same principles or same technique, always learning, always doing more. So I think there's like, I think you've touched on it a few times, Paul, there's a lot more on the horizon and um, I just, I'm excited about it. And uh, thank, I want to thank you for just teaching me and uh, helping me uh, really understand better so I can serve my patients better, but great work. Yep. Thank you so much.